Hello! If you're new here, I'm PB Raisinbread, and this is a comic that I'm making. This is page 12, and we are finally sort of meeting a character that I am very excited to actually get started introducing into the comic. She's one of the first characters that I made. Yeah, it's very exciting. If you've seen, I did a video of the character concepts of Eternus. Um, that's just sort of like a digital procreate speed paint, but she's in there and it mentions her name and then you also see, you know, like fully what she's about. And yeah, this is a little bit of a longer video, so I'm almost just sort of treating this like my own little podcast and I'm just gonna ramble about the comic and sort of how I had the idea and how I sort of developed it a little bit. Um, I know in a previous video I talked about how Eternus is basically the setting. It's the huge space station basically. And one thing that he usually inspired um, the world and the concept of the world is the RPG book Nibiru, which sort of that concept as a whole, just a big huge space station is sort of the limit of what I got from from Nibiru. Um, it's a wonderful RPG book. The game system and game mechanics is based off of like memories. So you can gain memories and lose memories. It's almost like a form of, of currency in a way. It's like almost like spell slots. Like I don't really know how it's to describe it. Um, one show that's absolutely spectacular that uses this system because when I first got the book I was like I want to you know hear people playing it it's called gone in all caps that table story does and it's just one of the most incredible stories that I've like heard from an actual play um it's incredible gone was also a huge influence in the way that the space station is a character and I, I don't want to spoil it if you want to listen to it but the way that the space station at some points almost seems to come alive in a way and influence the players and it's very cool i don't think mine's going to be quite that surreal as as gone is and that's sort of an internal in the characters heads and memories um but yeah, that's a huge influence, um, and also things like Star Wars, obviously, and Tilly Walden's On a Sunbeam. That graphic novel is incredible. It's that very sort of, once again, like surreal sci-fi. It's a beautiful story. In one of the parts in On a Sunbeam, there's this when she's going to like the, the girls' boarding school, there's these like fish pod racers so they're like pod pod racing but they like look like fish and the way that they move is almost like fish but it's like through the air it's through space and visually it's just beautiful and um it's a, a great story but yeah that got me thinking sort of like because you know when i was thinking oh sci-fi stuff is cool but I was thinking more at first like the Martian and I was like, I'm not really a sciencey person. I can't really like like back that claim up with, you know, like math and science and facts and stuff like that. But then going into like, you know, like 70s and 80s, like surrealist, like sci-fi comics. Hi, this is Reagan editing these voiceovers. I don't know why I did not mention Dune. <laughs> Dune is also a big influence. I don't know why I didn't even mention it. Um, another sci-fi book that I also like is Ender's Game, as well as um, A Long Way from a Small, or A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. Um, that is an incredible book as well. And, um, you know, things like Star Wars and Anna Sunbeam and Nibiru, like having these like fantasy elements or things that you can't quite explain, these like mystical, magical things in this sort of sci-fi setting is super cool. And so I came up with this drawing of a 
big sta space station that looked like a flower, specifically an aster, a uh, like daisy, and um, I thought it was a super cool setting. I don't think, I'm not sure even in the comic, like it, it would ever really be seen, um, but that's just sort of where I started, and I currently have like one whole composition notebook and you know big chunks of of some of my current sketchbooks dedicated to like writing different ideas of just the story in the world down some of them that you know i i trash like half of that composition notebook that you know i i started two and a half years ago i don't think i'll ever really use i don't think they'll either come into play in the comic or like you know i, tr I trashed the idea i was like no um, I don't think that's necessary or, you know, I thought of something better, you know? I was thinking of like, oh, well, like Star Wars, will there be a bunch of different, like, alien races? Will, or will this just be like a strictly, like, will this be Earth in the, f or like, sh the human race in the future? Like a Wally -E style all went into a space station. And I don't think so necessarily. I do think this is a society of people that you know, booked it out of their dying home world. I don't think that's necessarily, like, Earth and, like, the future of humanity. I mean, it could be, but I don't think that's really necessary for the story that I want to tell. You know, it could be, like, speculation. If, if this ever gets, like, readers and followers, that would then speculate. That could be something that they could talk about, um, but I don't think it's really necessary, ne really necessary to confirm. But, yeah, and so then going with that... Um, flower motif. I then had a really good naming convention that I could use, and I love a theme, you know, <laughs> you talk about, you know, something like, even like Dragon Ball Z, um, naming theme, um, all the way to, like, the locked tomb, and, you know, getting in the ninth, and how Tamsin Muir has such a very specific naming convention, um, going from the nine houses to freaking Wake and her name and that naming convention, as ridiculous as it is, is so interesting and gives you such a big insight into that culture and how much they value the past that they then revere Eminem lyrics and give them, like, to the names of these soldiers or whatever. Um, for someone who doesn't know The Lock Tomb, that's sort of the, a wild thing I just said. They're very good books. Even if I did spoil a little bit, I apologize. But yeah, they're really good books. So having a theme and a naming convention, you know, having a theme to start with gives you a really good sense of, there's, there's really something to go from here, not just with names, but with what this community and what the society values. Um, you know, r names really give things power. And so I named all of my characters off of different flowers and plants, either the colloquial term, I believe I said that right, or the more scientific Latin name, and even the um, cities. So there's, um, they, they all have sort of different meanings. I think I would have to like go back and like I did a lot of research on the names um I would have to go back into my notes to see exactly like um Dahlia um is you know one of them she's the doctor and then there's Carnation um Carnation is a good one that I remember off the top of my head um so Carnation is you know the religious leader I mentioned before but you know Carnation is um also known as like God's flower it has a lot of religious significance in, in that way. And then going into Poppy, um, how I talked in my previous video, Poppy sort of struggles with violence and like she's a soldier, she's a guard at, well, she was, spoiler alert, kind of trained to, to, be, a, to be in combat. She's a guard at the Founder's Temple. She struggles with violence. She tries to use, you know, She's like, this is the only thing I'm good at. This is the only way I can be useful. I can use it to do good at some points. But anyway, so that's why I named her Poppy. It's, you know, a the well-known, like, red poppy. Um, 
is known for like blossoming on battlefields. It's a flower that is often used for like war memorials and, and things like that. And sort of like a silent remembrance. This character here is also named after a flower, but she does have a nickname. So there are like things like nicknames like Morty, her full name is Momordica Burdock, which is actually a like the scientific name of like a fruit that um, only is in like some parts of the world, I believe in India and in other parts of Asia. Eaten, it's um, it's good for you, but it's like the few things that I could find about it, it's like very bitter. But if you can um, get past that, it's good for you. So I, I feel like that sort of is Morty's personality where she can be a bit standoffish. Um, to people that she doesn't know, and then she'll open up more. So certain things like that um, can really um, get a glimpse into some people's like characteristics or personalities or like their purpose in the story. And so then just finding like I have this character that has a very specific role in the story, and they have this specific like archetype. Like you can often find a flower for that either whether that flower has a certain medicinal or like food purpose or like a cultural purpose in a specific part of the world or even in like the like Victorian flower language like the meaning of a flower um you know going through all of those different things like I looked up a bunch of different stuff um I have like a huge list of like different flower names and then like their meanings in them in my obsidian notes um to sort of figure out all of that stuff. Let me actually look that up and read some of them. Okay, so I actually looked up the sort of meaning of the names of each of my characters, so I'm not completely talking out of my ass because while I can't remember anything for shit, I do take really good notes. So, um, going back to Dahlia, her full name is Dahlia Vervain, and she is a um, doctor. Um, she's Carnation's doctor specifically. Um, as I talked about in the previous video. Um, and so, Dahlia is a type of aster K flower. Um, so, the thing about um, Eternus is that the naming convention goes into, I went into like the different like genus and like families and species of flowers. And so then the like aster K, like those different flowers, I'm not sure how like detail I'm going to be into this or how accurate I'm going to be within my own lore like I might have to retcon some stuff I don't know um because once again I my memory is shit so um but so the flowers that are in like the Aster K family since the space station Eternus I sort of based that design off of a flower like designing the space station to sort of look like a flower the different areas in the space station um like there is the sort of center the core which would be like what's it called where the pollen is and then there's the petals and the petals are where the cities are and then the leaves are where like the farms manufacturing plants those like mining towns and cities um storage um that stuff would be and then there is the stem which is the a small part of the stem is used for highways and thoroughfares going into the leaves but then sort of south of that would be like the wilds sort of start um so the the wilds are basically more uncharted areas of Eternus, and then it would sort of get into that um there might be some more like like illegal like black market dealings sort of um in the shadows of these thoroughfares but then um going more south there there wouldn't be any people um yeah so anyway the <laughs> sort of aster k flowers and the pe and the flowers within that um that family would be like the noble families of Eternus because it's based off of the like aster flower so then the um so then the people that that is named after you know um so 
Dahlia is a type of astrocade flower, so she, you can, if, if you know the lore, you know, she would be a more noble, um, from a noble family, and in, like, the Victorian flower language, it means commitment or eternal love, um, and it can be used for medicinal purposes, like lowering blood sugar and, or blood pressure and cholesterol, and fun fact, the pink Dahlia is the most medicinal. And getting into the eternal love and commitment, I really hope that, you know, someday in the future, I can sort of deep dive into what I am sort of planning out as a intensely codependent relationship she has with Morty. Um, <laughs> those two have known each other for a really long time, their families. Um, knew each other and yeah getting into that um i think would be really fun so yeah medicinal she's a doctor going into someone like poppy it's like the war poppy which specifically is like remembrance um she has a lot of things in her past that um she is sort of she feels really guilty about let's put it that way Yeah, and Carnation specifically. Carnation, one, she doesn't have a last name. Um, fun fact about her. Yeah, Carnations um, are no also known as God's flower. And they mean like a mother's eternal love. And then they also mean heartache. Which, um, in the previous video when I was talking about Carnation, she has a lot of, a lot of stuff going on with her and sort of that burden that she carries um and how she deals with that um yeah and then i have a bunch of other characters in here that we haven't met yet there is a family called like the mulberries and there's like one character her name's laura mulberry um you know that's another one that i have i've got so many different names um that i can use and here's the thing is that their their names you know there's like i could use the name aaron because there is um it's kind of like a baby's breath i think it's aaron's beard is um what a flower is also colloquial colloquially named as or i could go into like technical or latin names if i want to name like a place um, then there are some that are more geared towards place, like Aconite, um, or Amaryllis. Amaryllis could also be a person's name, um, either way. Um, yeah, but there's so many different, so many different names. It is at sometimes difficult to come up with more masculine sounding names, I will say, with flowers. But that's also a fun challenge in itself. Um, and as you can see, there aren't too many male characters so far, so that wasn't necessarily a huge problem. But yeah, naming conventions are fun, and then that really can spiral into um, coming up with like the, the, the things that a culture sort of values. Um, yeah, because, I mean, I just thought it would be fun to have a space station that doesn't really have any plants on it specifically in like the petals in like the city of like aeon um and the other cities um because they don't really have flowers right and so to have like such a cultural importance on like flowers and like like do do they even know like what the flower they're named after looks like right like going into stuff like that like is this just something that like they know the meaning of the word but they don't know what the flower looks like um or they've only ever seen it um written in books and um the sort of value that that holds that um name was passed down maybe some families have specific flowers that are like preserved i know that i will have um some families like um the more noble families um and like rich the older families they will have 
you know, like small gardens or plants that um, take tremendous upkeep and they're, you know, very expensive. The seeds for these flowers are very expensive, um, but they do have like gardens and plants in their like estates. Um, and so that they might have more access to like that education of like what this flower means, what it does, what, you know, we are named after, right? Like the mulberry um, family, you know, might possibly have um, mulberry trees or even, you know, going so far as to say like they only have like one mulberry tree. Um, yeah, and then that's like a very significant like point of pride or um, like something that's very special to them and something that they need to protect and keep safe. Going into that, like the wilds that aren't charted, right, would the sort of plan is to have them sort of covered in plants and for that to be like a, a really big shock to the sort of party when they go on their quest as you know very few of them have have seen um plants carnation um carnation and poppy and dahlia specifically i feel like dahlia's family might have some plants and poppies did as well but carnation as the keeper of the like founder's tomb does have like plants it's almost like a con conservatory or like a garden of sorts with the tomb at the center um that it's sort of her role to upkeep and i mean this is sort of just strictly the cities you know the i feel like there are people who live close to the wilds um at the very least you know people who might go like through like the outskirts maybe you know scavenge some of those or forage um is more of the correct word um some of the plants there you know and then there are people in the like leaves maybe people who are because their farms do exist they are more of like sort of like a highly regulated like source of you know food um or medicine you know, growing plants to them, make into medicine, clothes, or things like, you know, soap, yada, yada, yada. I think there might be um, something where they grow or, you know, raise, keep cattle as well. Um, and it might be a thing where, you know, they've been able to keep those populations of animals alive through, like, very strict regulation for the amount of time that they've been on the you know the thousands of years that they've been on the space station they might have you know through the thousands of years there might have been you know um an animal that they discovered on the space station that then combined with some of the animals that they brought on board created some new new fun animals um it is at, at this point um more loosey-goosey with that sort of aspect of the world building because i don't think we'll really go into places like the leaves or anything like that having sort of the like well how do they get food or how you know does their sewer system work can be interesting if my characters did have like a chapter where they had to rummage through the sewer system you know what i mean and then sort of figuring that out would be a fun little puzzle but they're not um, and that's not, not, not a thing I'm going to do. Maybe, maybe I right now have chapter one written and then I have like a outline, but the outline is more of just like, you know, they go, um, you know, here, do this. They have a conflict with this person, that sort of very bullet point thing I have. I do have chapter one one fully written out and thumbnailed it's going to be 35 pages and then i do think i'll have a few pages of like lore 
um, where I'll do, you know, like a fun illustration and then I'll have, you know, a little bit of a lore dump at the end of the chapter. Um, I do think it's more fun to like really hook somebody by hopefully caring about the characters. You know, I'm not sure if in 35 pages people will, um, care about these characters too much, but, um, to really give them some, some fun characters or some fun questions to ask and then slowly start answering them once you have them hooked a little bit instead of just doing like a, like, historical or info lore dump in like the first, the first page or so. Right, so with something like this page, um, I've sort of through certain contact clues, you know, I... Um, for like the establishing shot on page one, I'm like, this is the Founder's Temple in Aeon. Um, and then when Carnation was introduced, I'm like, this is Carnation, you know, the keeper of the Founder's Temple, right? That's her title. But in the actual comic, I don't necessarily explain what that means. Um, you can get through context clues that, you know, she's an important figure of some sort. And then in this page, I think specifically, I feel like it's really confirmed that this is a, a religion, right? Um, because, you know, this is a, a church service that we're sort of, of listening in on. And the, you know, architecture of it is very um, Catholicism based because I wanted something grand, visually grand, um, that I could really play around with. Um, but I did want to give some of those sci-fi elements as well um so those sort of 70s 80s sci-fi comics really came into play with the architecture as well as well as the sort of lighting um i feel like i'm getting better at really playing with the like black ink and the shadows like because with these people that are around this character we don't really need to know exa exactly what they look like we just need to know that they're are a lot of people here and they're like crowded in this big opulent church for this church service um it isn't super important what they look like i could have done um if i wanted to go into more detail about what they look like i could have gone into more particular details about the how the hierarchy works like the sort of clergy and like the nuns and stuff sit in like the very first rows and then you've got like the super rich people that sit um, in the rows behind them and then it sort of goes like into like sort of lower and lower class until you get to the people standing in the back, right? But that really doesn't come up in the comic. Um, and that isn't really necessary for this part of the story. I do think it's interesting. Um, but, you know, I, I did make it, so, <laughs> um, but I do, I do think it might come into play later, that sort of aspect, um, but I am really excited to get to this character. I mean, I, I think may, maybe at the most, at, at the very most, like, 200 people will watch this video, and, you know, most of them will drop off at, like, the two-minute mark, so, um, I feel very safe to say. So this character is, um, Z. Um, her full name is Azalea. And, um, I, I think she's a very cool character. She's, you know, that very much, like, mysterious. Like, I have, you know, knowledge that you need. I can take you to where you need to go. So when, um, Dolly and Morty are like, we need to get Carnation out of here, um, and we need to go into the wilds, and Poppy, we need your help, because none of us are really fighters, and we're gonna have to be, you know, taking care of Carnation most of the time. We need your, your help to protect us, because the, the wilds are supposedly dangerous, and then, you know, Z sort of pops up and says, you know, I've been to the wilds before, I've lived there. I can take you to where you need to go, um, and obviously they're very suspicious, but, you know, on, on the time crunch and with an opportunity like that, they're like, okay, whatever, come with us. We just got to get out of the, the city first and then we'll go from there. And that's sort of where chapter one ends. 
this group of people desperately trying to save, you know, Carnation's life, and then you get this, um, you know, sort of outsider in the mix who they, they have to trust, um, or they, they have to at least sort of take her word for it, you know, and, and not really know anything about her. But spoiler alert, she has lived in, in the wilds before for a couple of years, and she was so also a fun fact about Eternus is that it does have um when I um was talking about oh I'm I'm not sure if I really want any like like crazy like alien races or anything like that similar to Star Wars in this book I I did go sort of the um sort of cyborg and clone route there are like body modifications once again they're highly regulated and things like clones are illegal which will also come into play later see if you've watched my video of like her character concept design and like her reference sheet that I made for her she's basically like a sci-fi fairy I she's like a, a fairy cyborg I made like wings she's got like her like pointy ears but they're like digital they are like almost like they have like an antenna um, coming out of the ear and they've got like you know stuff going on um, and then her wings are almost like dragonfly wings and they've got like circuit board Im imagery and they're like sort of um, grafted onto her back um, so that's why she wears like a cloak <laughs> um, there aren't really many people like her in the world and if they are they're kept under lock and key and so she um has to find you know jobs and a way of living sort of under the radar and so she's been around sort of on the edge of the wilds where a lot of you know more illegal stuff goes on in the sort of right before the the comic happened she was very recently a mercenary which once again will come into play of of why z is here in the founder's temple um because surprise surprise she's not really the most religious person you know she is here at the temple for a specific reason um and that reason does align with the group's values um, even though they don't necessarily trust her at first. I, I do really like the dynamic of, like, they don't really trust each other, but they have a common goal, but they sort of learn to work together, and then there's, like, that sort of found family aspect that I find really charming. Yeah, I, I think specifically Z and Poppy's dynamic, if I write it correctly, which fingers crossed, you know, I hope I do, I think their dynamic can be very interesting because Poppy is like the very loud punch first, ask questions later, like she's very upfront with things like that while um, Z is more of the covert ops. She's more of the like assassin stealth going quick and quiet. She'll use whatever, you know, if she has a goal in mind and she really wants to achieve it, she'll sort of use whatever dirty method she can to achieve that goal and that's not really poppy's speed combined with the like initial mistrust that poppy has of her just sort of popping in at the perfect moment to say hey you you guys need help i have a very specific skill set that you know you need to survive i have to come with you that sort of sets off poppy's mistrust for her I, I think that, dyna that that dynamic and sort of them learning to trust each other, sort of asking one another for help because, you know, I, with their certain skill sets, if they learn to work together, they can be an incredibly, you know, powerful duo, but they just gotta learn how to do that, which, once again, if I write it correctly, um, hopefully I'll be able to do. But yeah, that's my rambling for 40 minutes or 38 minutes about my comic Turnus. Um, I'm on page 12. None of the stuff that I've talked about is actually in the comic yet, but hopefully it'll get there. So thank you for watching. I hope you have a lovely day. Goodbye!